All right, now we're clicking. Um, okay, so this is Computer Science 200, which is uh, our first introduction to computer programming, but it's kind of our gateway drug to convert you who are not computer science majors or minors towards that major or minor. Um, so we're going to implement little video games and stuff like that through a drag and drop type tool. So we're not going to scare the crap out of you with computer science programming syntax this semester. We're going to show you all the cool stuff you can do and then scare the crap out of you next semester. Um, so, but then at that point you're locked in because it's like, oh, well, I got too many credits. I can't switch majors now. Um, so in any case, that's the uh, scoop with the course in general. Uh, syllabus is on Angel. Um, here's the crap. This is me. I'm uh, uh, Dr. Mike Lippman. You can call me Mike. You can call me Yo Fatty. I'll answer to pretty much anything. Doesn't matter. Uh, this is my cell phone. You can text me at that as well. Uh, probably actually the best way of reaching me is text as opposed to uh, um, calling me. I probably won't answer. Email. Also get it on my phone. So either of those is fine. You know when the class meets. Um, this is the text for the class that you probably had to buy for your 150 class or 175 class or something like that. I won't use it. It's just we have to officially require it for all the CS classes. Um, so, whatever. Uh, there is a textbook we use in this class, but you don't have to buy it. It's on the, uh, it's on Angel. Let's see here. It's called uh, Learn Game Salad for iOS. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be writing little video games for iPhones. That kind of stuff. So, should be kind of cool. But here's the PDF for it, and it's you can print it off or whatever you want to do. It's it's legal for us to use for education. Um, okay. Uh, objectives you can read through that crap. It's nothing. It's just fluff. Let's see. Okay, grading. Forty percent of your grade will be homework assignments. Yeah, I thought you were gonna miss the first day of class here too. Did I pass you last semester? Yes, you did. Really? Yes, you did. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this shouldn't have happened. Um, really? Yes, sir. Oh my gosh. All right, so 40% of the grade will be homework assignments. Um, so we'll have a lot of those. Uh, they'll all be using a, uh, well, you might have a couple of papers here and there, but generally speaking, your homework assignments are going to be using a tool called Game Salad, which I'll show you here in a few minutes. Um, I tend to give a lot of quizzes. Um, quizzes uh, will be little pop quizzes. Sometimes they're little stupid things. Sometimes, uh, um, you know, they're more involved uh, questions. Quizzes should be very, very easy for you to answer if you paid attention the previous class. So very commonly, I'm giving you quizzes just to make sure that you, A, showed up to class, because I'm not going to spend 20 minutes at the beginning of each class taking attendance. I'll eventually learn all your names at some point. Um, uh, but, you know, when I give you a pop quiz, it's probably going to be dealing with something I talked about in the previous class or something to do with your homework assignment or something like that. So uh, I would at least spend a little time uh, between classes, uh, at least thinking about the stuff we talked about in here. Um, so that's, that's kind of on you. That's 20% of the grade. Uh, realistically, there shouldn't be any reason why all of you can't have a 90% or better for that part of the grade. I don't want you to be afraid of quizzes. I don't design them to be hard. I designed it to make sure that you're engaged in the class in some way. Midterm is 20% of your grade. Final is 20% of your grade. What I do is if you bomb the midterm and you come back and do much better on the final, I'll replace your midterm with your final grade, the exam from the, uh, your grade from the final exam. Uh, not the other way around, though. If you ace the midterm and you get a five on the final, I won't do the grade. So my job is the end of the semester to give you a grade based on how well you've mastered the material. So uh, I believe you should get as many opportunities to do that as possible. But if you just suck the entire time, apparently I'll pass you anyways, right? So, man, he showed up like twice last semester. I still passed him. Oh, my gosh. How many quizzes did you miss? Wow. So I'm a pushover. Is, <laughs> is what it comes down to. Uh, your standard uh, grading CL 90, 80, 70, 60. Um, top and bottom 2% of each of those are the pluses and minuses. Uh, I reserve the right to curve um, up. I won't change the scale down. 
Um, I don't commonly curve. Usually, uh, computer science classes, you have a lot of people who get A's. You have a smaller number of people who get B's, and then everybody else kind of gets D's and F's. Um, you very rarely do you just get the people in the middle. So sometimes I'll drop the B scale down a little bit into the high 70s or something, but generally speaking, I stick to this. Okay, questions about the class in terms of grading and that kind of crap. All right. Let's see, what are we doing here? Well, just quickly then, uh, are we kind of gambling here with whether the internet works? I'll just give you a preview of the tool we'll be using in here. Uh, so we use a tool called Game Salad. Uh, I'll give you a first reading assignment, uh, probably not today, but uh, maybe on a Wednesday or Friday. Um, you're late. I don't. Did I pass you last semester? Yeah. The thing is, I'm not even kidding about either of those guys. Your birthday's tomorrow. And yours is too. I know. Did you get me anything? Did you get me anything? No, why would I? I passed you. <laughs> 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 All right, so we're going to be using this tool called Game Salad. Um, uh, like I mentioned before, it's um, uh, it's a tool specifically designed for creating video games for either PC, Mac, um, more interestingly for us maybe uh, iOS and Android, so iPhones and Android devices. Um, it's all the same. You don't have to do anything different for iPhone or Android. It's you just decide what screen size you're making this stuff for. But it allows us to use kind of drag and drop tools and then it's just kind of our imagination um, for making the games. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be connecting the things that we talk about in here, utilizing this tool Game Salad, to computer programming problem solving techniques that you're going to need next semester when we scare you with some syntax. And I'll show you some syntax in here. Um, so that when you're doing this stuff next semester, your brain already works in a computer problem solving way so that you're only having to learn the new syntax, not also how to solve problems for computers. Okay, so that's kind of the punchline. So this tool is kind of cool and uh, um, uh, by the end of the semester, every one of you will be able to write, create some sort of game on here if you want. And realistically, I mean, all of you have heard of like games like Angry Birds, right? Anybody in here not know about Angry Birds? Probably leave now. Um, so whoever wrote that probably made a lot of money. You could probably make Angry Birds in a weekend with this tool. So if you have a good imagination, who knows? You might be the next millionaire. All right. So questions about any of that crap? So let's start talking about some stuff so we can get to the fun tool as soon as possible. All right, so uh, let's see. All of you in here have had 150, correct? Dr. Locklear or Professor Wall? What? Well, which one? Who, had, who in here had Dr. Locklear? What does he say computer science is? Problem solving, but he says it in kind of a boring way, right? The like computer science is problem solving. We had a student one time in here make a game for their uh, project that had uh, Dr. Locklear as like one of the bosses, and that was his like kind of zombie -ish, like computer science is probably. Yes. All right, so so problem solving. So for some of you who've had my 200 or 250 class, I review some of this at the beginning, but you know, chances are the people who've had that probably shouldn't have passed it, so you guys are seeing it again. Um, so how many of you think you're a good problem solver? Well, let's go the other way. How many of you think you're a bad problem solver? One of you? One person who's honest in here? <laughs> Human beings are really, really, really good problem solvers. We're so good, in fact, that's why we suck at computer programming. Computer programming is a, uh, a very hard skill to initially learn because we have to forget about all these years of experience. Most of you have had 18, 19, 20 years of experience at this point. Um, problem solving to the point that we forget how we problem solve. So the question I always ask is on your way to class today, how many of you uh, um, 
bumped into any walls. You always get the one smart ass who says they did. Um, we all missed the walls, right? How? How many of you thought about it? Actually remember thinking about, I need to miss that wall. I need to miss that dude who's texting and not paying attention. Any of you think about that this morning as you were coming to class? How many of you came to class and you were texting while you were coming to class? Barely even paying attention, right? And you still missed the walls. How did you do that? We don't know. But magically it happened for a bunch of us. Even you? Bad problem solver? So now try to explain to me, how did you miss those walls? Let's slow our mind down a little bit and think. As you were, we'll use the bad problem solver. So as you're walking, were you texting too? Yeah. Okay, so you're a crappy problem solver and you actually put yourself in a handicap. <laughs> you're an athlete, aren't you? What sport do you play? Lacrosse. Oh. That explains that. Actually, not really. <laughs> hockey would explain it. Any of you hockey players in here? I thought football players were bad. <laughs> Hockey player, whoa. All right, so you're texting, you're walking, you're a crappy problem solver, you still miss the walls. How? Try to, try to explain to me what steps you took to miss those walls. Okay, how? Probably by the fourth or fifth time I say how, it's going to get annoying, but we'll keep going. Go ahead. Peripheral vision. What is that? Okay, kind of vision on the side. All right, I'm okay with that. So, how did you how did you use the side vision to uh, uh, figure out your surroundings, whatever that means? Okay. What about other people? Okay, so you were you were gathering from your surroundings using your magical side vision to uh, notice potential impacts. So you basically treated your entire uh, surroundings as asteroids, okay? And you were a spaceship trying not to get hit by the asteroids, right? So you're already doing game programming. It's awesome. Okay, so, and, and somehow you maneuvered so that they all missed you, right? Frogger. You're playing Frogger. I mean, you never played Frogger. <laughs> really? Frogger came out when... You, your parents were in junior high when Frogger came out. <laughs> so you played Frogger. No wonder he's a bad problem solver. Okay. So you like hopped on top of people and you waited for the... So now the question is, is as you're going down the hall, are you weaving in and out of people or do you take more of my approach? See, when you're 6'5", 380, they move for you. <laughs> I just kind of set a direction and then if somebody's not paying attention, just make noises. <laughs> and they tend to move. Um, I know a couple of you in here kind of know my backstory a little bit, but in a, uh, I own software companies now. You've maybe seen my car, the awesome fat car outside. But uh, um, any, how many of you have, have never, how many of you have seen that car that says awesome fat on it? A big red car. Uh, any of you know where the name came from? Okay, go ahead. We'll let the pro bad problem solver say. Uh, yeah, I used to be a professional eater. Of all things to be good at, right? So once upon a time, I was the number one ranked distance eater in the world. Distance eating is how much you can consume in an hour. So I currently hold the world record at 17 pounds, two and a half ounces of beef in 41 minutes. That's why I can just walk down the hall and people just move. <laughs> I can't, I can barely even finish my breakfast now. It's on my has been. But anyways, that's where the funny name comes from and my funny ties and all that crap. Um, so you're dodging people. And because you're a lot smaller, even though you're a lacrosse player, I don't, you're not a good lacrosse player, are you? <laughs> really? Is Justin Krause still here? He graduated. I think so. You think so? He was on the lacrosse team. Did you know him from the lacrosse team? Oh, so you just made up that I think so. Yeah. I got it. All right. All right so, um, in any case, uh, so you're weaving and bobbing around people, okay? So you're losing your magical side vision, and somehow you just got here, right? Yeah. Do you suspect you probably just skipped a whole lot of problem-solving steps in there? Yeah. Probably. 
Definitely. But at the very least, you thought about that, the, the act of getting to class without hitting stuff a little bit. And we already saw how much that expanded that. Computer programming is going to take that to a whole other level. Okay. As you're walking down the hall, how do you walk? Tell me about walking. I always have to be careful in case somebody's not, not, not in here with like a wheelchair or something. But How do you walk? If you were to give me instructions on walking, what would you say? I got to start with the left foot. Okay, so left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Okay, well, I'm thinking about feet. What, what the heck am I doing with them? Well, I had to put it in front of the other. Well, I can't reach now. All right, so the left foot, right foot. Okay, let's go a little deeper than that. Do I got to use my peripherals, side magic, side vision to walk? Or is that not part of that part? Not part of that part. We're all pretty good at walking, aren't we? You're doing it while texting, and you've already your self-proclaimed crappy problem solver. <laughs> so how the heck did you stay upright while walking and missing people and texting? And playing Frogger, apparently. Um, walking something we all just take for granted. You even think, do you even think about it when you're walking? So what is it? If you had to write me a recipe for walking, what might you say? Well, first we got to stand. What does that mean? See where this is going? Okay. So we'll assume we know what standing means for this example. So we're standing there. Okay, and you want to start with the left foot. Fair enough. Got to start with one of them, right? Okay, at least you knew left and right. We had some concerns there. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with the left foot. What do you want me to do? I'm, I'm in a standing position. So we'll, we'll go ahead. I'm in a standing position here. Okay. Oh, I know my left and right. Well, that's given information. Now, what do I got to do? Remember, I'm heavy, so if I go down, this desk is toast. Okay. By the way, for those of you who haven't had me, I'm a little bit weird. So you'll have fun with this. Class is usually fun. All right, go ahead. I'm, re I'm ready. Place your left foot forward. On the ground. Okay, got it. And then follow with your right. Follow with my right. I don't know. Follow, well, not follow your left. Put your. Uh, do the same thing with your right foot. You place it in front of you. Make sure it goes in front of the left one. And then just keep your balance. Oh, then just keep my balance? Oh, wow. Well, it doesn't have to go directly in front, just relatively in front. Okay, relatively in front. All right, so to fill in a couple of the blanks there, I'm standing here. I'm going to start falling forward. I purposely lose my balance, right? We'll assume that we know what balance is. And I'm going to catch myself with my left foot. And then I'll lose my balance again. Catch myself with my right foot. So walking is all about losing your balance and catching your balance. And it's something that we learned years and years and years ago that we don't even think about anymore. As we're walking down the hall, we are in a constant state of almost falling over. How many of you fell over on your way to class today? Remember, it's a dry campus. <laughs> so we need to ask ourselves, how do human beings solve problems? Okay, so we need to generalize that down so that we can look at how programming languages, which we are going to talk about at the high level, then we're going to look at how Game Salad is a substitute for programming languages you know, at, at our level in here. But we, we're we all professional human problem solvers. And I promise you, even the idiot over here is a great... Is that hyphenated? What, what's your name, by the way? Alex. Alex? Okay, but you know, Steve, you know, uh, Krauss. Yes. All right, so how do humans do it? What tools do we have in our toolbox for solving problems as a human being? Right off the bat, we have our memory. How many of you think about your memory? 
I'll follow it up. We'll just assume he's going to have a negative answer. But, you know, how many of you think you have a good memory? Some of us do. Oh, you actually think you have a good memory? You just raise your hand for anything. Oh, you have good. Bad problem solver, good memory. That's why he remembers he's a bad problem solver. Okay, so we all use our memory all the time, but we don't really think about it, right? We don't think about walking. We don't think about our memory. What things do our, does our memory do for us? How do we use our memory? It's kind of just this thing up there, right? We don't really think about it. Pun intended, I guess. <laughs> Nobody says that phrase anymore, pun intended, do they? Makes me feel very old. See, when I started teaching, I was like your age. This is my, this is my 15th year, 16th year teaching. We said that crap back then. I, I start feeling older. I'm, I'm 37 tomorrow. Gosh. I just cry a little bit on the inside. <laughs> All right, so, so again, pun intended, I guess. Um, how do we use our memory? What tool is that for us? How do we access it? What do we put in there? How do we retrieve stuff? Give me some examples of things that we do on a daily basis that require our memory. Go ahead. Getting up. Getting up. Okay, how does your memory how is your memory used to get up? We definitely do that every day, but how is your how do you utilize your memory for that? Um you remember how to use your arms to stand up or sit up. Okay. So once you're awake. Inside your memory somewhere is, is all of these pre-learned lessons, like how to walk and all that crap. That's in there. Okay, fair enough. Go ahead. Uh, how your body will come okay. Possibly, yeah. Did that internal clock. What's your name again? Alex. Oh, how did you know that? Is that stored somewhere up here? Yeah. Somewhere up there, you got a little, uh, uh, little entry that says, me equals Alex. Right? All of you know your phone number? Somewhere up there, it's my phone number equals whatever your phone number is. It's a whole bunch of, it's a database of crap up there, right? Now, I mean, how many of you actually know your friend's phone numbers? Maybe a couple of you might know like your best friend's phone number, but the person you call the most often. Like I know my wife's phone number, but I, that's, that's the extent of it. Everybody else we just do by picture, right? On your, on your cell phone? Man. Well, more space for other things. Other pieces of useless information. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of stuff we just store in there. How did you retrieve your name? When I asked you what your name is, you know for a fact you got it from somewhere up here. You had to go look it up. You didn't feel like you had to look it up because, like, name is that common piece of information. It's, you never, you're never in that situation where your name is on the tip of your tongue and can't just can't spit it out. If... <laughs> If that ever happens to you, you need to go somewhere because it's something, something bad's going down. Okay? But generally speaking, we don't have that problem with our name, but maybe the name of a movie or a certain actor, things like that. Things are less readily available to us. We might sit there like, oh, what is it? What is it again? And then what, like 15 minutes later, we're not even thinking about it, it pops in? That's weird, right? How did you access your name from your brain? See, now your name's in my brain. I've somehow stored it there. How did you access it, though? You just did. Wouldn't it be important if you, I mean, if you're, if you think about yourself, your body being this piece of equipment that has all these features, and one of, one of the features is downloading information from the brain. Shouldn't you be able to teach somebody else how to do that? We don't want other people messing around in our brains, right? But shouldn't you at least know how to do it? Like, well, I, I can. I can do it. Why do I need to know how to do it? I just do it. Again, another example of how human beings are such good problem solvers that we have problems slowing things down and remembering how we solve many problems. Okay? So somehow we're able to put information in and retrieve information from our brain. That's our memory. How debilitating would it be if we didn't have memory as a tool that we could use to solve problems. What if I took all your memory away? You got all your other tools, you know, any the things that we don't have on the list yet, 
you, those are still available to you, but you don't have memory. Would that be a big deal? Huge deal, right? You know, they make light of it in the movies when you have somebody with short-term memory or something, short-term memory loss. But that's extremely debilitating, right? Very few problems we'd be able to solve without our memory. Okay, so we really rely on that. All right, another problem, another tool in our toolbox for solving problems is asking questions. We all made it to class on time today, right? Ish. That's, that's actually true. But you usually make it. Kyle does not. See, I stored that name in my memory sometime last semester. It was when I was going in and marking off absences. That's when it kind of solidified, I think. Um, so you got here on time. What time does this class start? 11, 11.05, whatever. Okay. Did you know it was 11.05? No, I thought it was 11.10. I was still late anyway. Which is it? Is it 11.05 or 11.10? I think it's 11.05. Um, but whatever. Oh, by the way, for, the, for your information, almost always quizzes are at the very beginning of class. Another incentive for showing up on time. Because it's always funny when somebody walks in. This happened to you a bunch. Somebody walks in like, oh, you missed the quiz. I just sit there and grin at you. There's this pile of papers here. And even the ones you took, you might as well have missed. <laughs> huh? Didn't you draw a picture on one of them? Yeah, I guess what was a pointer. Yeah, yeah, you just, yeah, what was a pointer? And you just drew a point, picture of it. <laughs> and he passed. Wow. All right, so, you all showed up to class on time. How? At some point in the morning, did you ask yourself, what time is it? Did you ask yourself, how long will it take me to get to class? Maybe you had a class right before this. So you had a class that maybe got out at, what, 10, 10.55? You had 10 minutes to get to class. Maybe you asked yourself, do I have time to go grab a cup of coffee? Do I have time to get a soda? Do I have a time to swing back by my, uh, uh, by my room to drop off a book or, you know, stuff like that? We ask ourselves questions constantly, but very, not very often do we actually think about it as asking questions. So going back to getting to class today without bumping into people or hitting walls or falling over, didn't you constantly ask questions during that? So you're walking down the hall, am I going to hit a wall? Am I going to hit a person? Am I going to fall over? You know, somewhere in your mind, you're like, okay, I have lost my balance. The proper foot to catch myself with is the right. So now you have to somehow magically use your skill set to get your muscles to swing your leg forward and you're doing this whole acrobatic act to catch yourself. And you need to do it in a way that you can still have self-respect, right? You don't want people to like laugh at you because you're just kind of tumbling down the hall. That's like, a, a, that's funny you do that, right? Um, so... I had a student once, I saw him at Home Depot, and his hobby was, like, to fall down in front of people. Isn't that stupid? He, like, would pretend to get hurt, and one time he fell down and did get hurt, and I thought it was funny. I laughed. So I, one of my hobbies is human misery. Um, yeah, it really kicks in during midterms and finals. It's my favorite time of the semester. Um, so we ask questions constantly as we're walking down that hall even though we're not thinking about asking questions. Because we drive ourselves crazy, wouldn't we? If inside your head, you're just constantly saying, am I going to hit a wall? Am I going to hit a wall? Am I going to hit a person? Am I falling over? We're doing it, but we don't know we're doing it. All right, so asking questions. Very important. Could we solve any problems without, I mean, think about the problems you solve on a daily basis that we haven't even considered at this point. Could we solve them without asking questions? You already told me you couldn't solve them without a memory wouldn't even remember the answer to our question if we didn't have a memory. Asking questions is pretty important, right? Third way, we solve problems. Spell that right? Close enough? Repetition. Isn't the act of walking solving the same problem over and over and over and over again? Okay, And a lot of things that we do. 
there's repetition involved. Okay, but now we can take it back more to like mechanical type uh, uh, solutions to problems. Let's say you're you're uh, putting stamps on envelopes. Okay, if I give you a roll of stamps and I give you a stack of envelopes, and I told and I told you I need these stamps on I need one stamp per envelope. All of us in here could do that, right? Even if you had never done that job before, all of us have a perception of how that might work, and you could sit down and do it, right? And wouldn't it get pretty mindless after a few few envelopes? Unless you were licking the stamps, then it just kind of starts tasting bad. Do they even have lickable stamps anymore? <laughs> I think you might have been serious. <laughs> They're all stickers now, aren't they? Who uses stamps anymore? Snail mail? We'll just email it. Once we get those uh, 3D printers, we can just start emailing schematics and have them print off what we were going to send them. They're like printing cars now. You see that? I posted something on Facebook. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, I'm on Facebook. You can friend me on there. I post a lot of technology stuff as well as pictures of my cat, who is often um, the source of quiz questions. I had three cats. One of my cats died. I was about Nick. It was Nick's fault. I had a student last semester sat right there. And at the final exam, he said, uh, the exam was pretty evil. He said, I hope your cat dies. And a week later, that cat died. <laughs> so I, I had three cats. The one that died was my least favorite. Um, yeah, she was a pile of crap, that cat. I mean, we loved her. We had her for like 11 years. But, man, she... She was on Prozac. We, when we went out of uh, out of town, you know, we had to be care We had to worry because she was going to pee on everything. She had issues. Yeah, and when we took her to the vet, she was like a thousand dollars every time we go to the vet because they had to knock her out, even like to give her shots. Didn't your wife like love her and didn't want to get rid of her? No, we both hated the cat, but that was my wife's cat. My wife held that cat like a teddy bear every night. Yeah, so it was it was my wife's cat. So it was like you know, it's like a we loved her, but we didn't like her. You know what I'm saying? One of those things. But yeah, she kicked the bucket. Yeah, so we, we were in the vet, at the vet for shots and stuff. They had her out and they found this big mass in her abdomen and said that we could operate, but you'll buy like three weeks or something. So we just didn't wake her up, save some money on the, the uh, well, the surgery. First of all, it would have been expensive. Yeah, Nick didn't like He like sent my wife like an apology letter. He felt really bad. It was funny. <laughs> But my other two cats are 25% lynx. So they're, uh, we got them from an animal rescue place in Arkansas about a decade ago. And my cat is really fat. Her gut drags the floor. She takes after me. And she's mean. Like that, oh, that cat loves me. She would never bite me at all. But she, she's, she bites my wife pretty often. Anybody else enters the house, that cat's killing them. She's awesome. That's Gracie. So my kitty is Gracie. Store that in the memory. That could be a quiz question. I got a picture of Gracie. Let's see a cute picture of Gracie. Look, look at that. She wouldn't hurt anybody, would she? So mean. How did I get onto that? How did I go from repetition? I get off topic often, by the way. How did I get onto repetition from that? Licking stamps. Licking stamps. That's the segue. <laughs> it's always fun to find out how we got where we got. All right. I don't, still don't know how we got there, but that's where it started. All right. So, putting stamps on the envelopes. <laughs> All of you could do it. And it's going to become repetitive, right? Take the stamp off. Put it on the envelope. Put the envelope that you've stamped on the pile that's for stamped envelopes. Rinse, lather, repeat, right? Okay, so repetition is something we, we use to solve problems all the time. All right, so now I'm going to actually copy that slide. We're going to say, how do computers do it? through programming languages. Okay, so a programming language is a tool that attempts, let's actually 
a tool that attempts to mimic the way humans solve problems. That's what a programming language is. It takes into consideration how do human beings solve problems, and it says, okay, here's some tools that we think you could use while you're writing your programs that will allow you to solve problems in a hopefully similar manner to how you solve problems in real life. Okay? Memory is accomplished through something called variables in programming languages. Asking questions is accomplished through something called conditionals. Generally speaking, you might call those if statements. We have a couple different types of conditionals, but if statements are our go-to. Repetition is accomplished through something called loops. Okay? So, everything in this class is about problem solving. As Dr. Lackler said, computer science is problem... Does, does Professor Wall say that too? Stole his slides. Actually, does, does Professor Wall's slides have like the... Uh, the abstraction thing on it with Einstein? Totally Locklear slide. <laughs> and, a lot of oh my god, those the the Zeb and Martha. <laughs> oh my god. Isn't that terrible? Especially when you have to he has to tell you to laugh. Dr. Locklear ever do that? No, the wall laughs for you. Does he? Yes, he does. Really? He does. I'm the only one who he actually makes you laugh. We need we need we need to upgrade this department a little bit. Actually, if you take the average, take the three professors, the three full time in computer science, you average us together, we're almost a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> almost, I'm pretty far over on one side. Um, okay, so this is our connection here. It's this problem solving. So let's start talking about. Programming languages in general. If we're going to give a definition to this, I'll just copy that over. Programming languages can come in a bunch of forms. So, for instance, in here, we're going to use something called Game Salad. Even though a mental picture might say a language looks like a bunch of symbols. A language is really a tool that we use to express meaning. Right? So all of us in here speak English. Uh, any of you speak a second language? What language? Arabic. Okay. So when you're speaking to your Arabic friends, you're probably using Arabic. Two purposes. You probably know Arabic better than English. And secondly, you want to keep your Arabic up to date. Otherwise, you lose it, right? Well, you don't lose it completely. It's like riding a bike, but to some point, you start losing it. So we have mo you have multiple means by which you can express stuff to other people. Now, all of us have that second language. We all have the, 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 the hand language. Not really the formal sign language, but, you know, we got the thumbs up. That means something, right? Yeah. Holding your hand. We got, some, we got some other ways of expressing ourselves. So those are other tools in our toolbox. But Game Salad would be an example of something that would be a programming language, except the way that we express ourselves is through widgets that have abilities, tools, that we drag and drop onto the screen. Other languages might be a language like C++. What other programming languages have you heard of? Python? HTML5, very specific, okay. My favorite, Java. Java. All right, what else? Pearl. Pearl? Ooh. You a programmer? No. You just heard of Pearl? It's a very old school language. Yeah. People don't write in Pearl anymore. Pearl's back from the early days of the internet. What else? C sharp. C -sharp.
Any other ones that pop in there? This is a pretty decent list. How about Visual Basic? Have you heard of Visual Basic? That's programming for dummies. Nobody uses Visual Basic. How many of you are Visual Basic programmers? <laughs> Nobody's raising their hand now. All right. The next set of slides, next portion of these slides is really funny. There are three types, type topics, types, types of programming languages. Machine language, low level, high level. Okay, so three types of programming languages. Machine language, low level, high level. So you've all had 150 and uh, how many of you have had 175? You're taking that now. That's concurrent with this one for many of you. Some of you already had it. Okay. Um, so what's machine language? Ones and zeros. Computers speak in binary, right? Like bits, zeros and ones. Zero and one. Whole bunch of those. Now, true computer programmers would obviously speak the language of the computer, right? Like Bender from uh, Futurama. That's kind of current, isn't it? A little bit. Like five years ago. How many of you have seen Futurama? Seen the things when like Bender puts on his plays and just sits there and speaks in ones and zeros? One, one, zero, zero, zero. You know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. So, true programmers would speak machine language, right? You get the little two-button keyboard. Just hammer it out. What's wrong with that for people? Well, it would definitely take forever. Any other problems you see with it? Very quickly, a human being would make mistakes, right? We don't, even those of us who think we have a good attention span, don't have an attention span that can keep up with that, right? It's too much detail, okay? That's not a friendly language for us. So machine language is zeros and ones, and it's not really compatible with human beings. Nobody programs in machine language. We might work with zeros and ones in some other problem-solving endeavors, but nobody programs in machine language. Low-level languages have a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. Now, what is a CPU? Let me toss another slide in here right before here, maybe. What do you know about that guy? Go ahead. Isn't it control processing unit? Central processing unit? Okay, that's what it stands for. Oh, the question is, can I spell it? Yeah, okay, there we go. So that's what it stands for. Well, what is it? Where it goes through and breaks down all the steps to solve the problem. Where it goes through and breaks down all the steps to solve a problem. It's basically the neural part of where the information goes through and gets processed before it's displayed on the screen. But now you're using the process word again, right? That's part of what it stands for. But you also said it breaks down the problem? From what our language is, but don't know what it is. Let's just say no. Not horribly wrong, but yes, wrong. From the low level to high level? Nope. That's a compiler. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, now we're getting a little closer. So think of the CPU as being this little engine. Okay, it's a little widget that's part of your computer. It's in a very important part of the computer, but it actually solves a very specific task. You give it an instruction, and it translates that, in, in, that instruction into something that, into one, I usually refer to them as magic tricks, into one of the magic tricks that your CPU knows how to perform. Okay, so you can think of your CPU as kind of like a magician. It has a list of like 500 magic tricks it knows how to do. It knows how to take this information and move it over to this spot in memory. It knows how to uh, put something onto the screen. Well, not really put it on the screen. It 
does it by doing a little tiny magic trick. And then you put a whole bunch of magic tricks in a row, and all of a sudden something's magically on the screen. Okay? So the CPU knows how to perform a whole bunch of little tasks internally. That's the set of, the set of instructions the CPU understands. So it's a tool which knows how to perform a bunch of magic tricks like moving memory from one place to another, etc. Okay? Computery type things. All right? Now, getting back to the low-level language, this guy has a one-to-one -one relationship. Should be has here, right? Has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. So that means in a low-level language, every line of code is equivalent to exactly one instruction or one magic trick that the CPU knows how to perform. All right. Now, I'm telling you that even to do the simplest little task, like making the word hello world appear on the screen on a computer, might take 20 or 30 magic tricks in a row in order for that to actually happen. Okay, so the little magic tricks that our CP knows how to do are very, very, very specific. They do very little things, and we do enough little things in a row and we accomplish real tasks. Okay, which is kind of like we were talking about problem solving earlier. Even now we've described walking or going down the hall without bumping into the walls at a very high level, right? We haven't talked about, you know, what kinds of little electrical signals need to go from our brain to a certain muscle to make the muscle either extend or contract or all that other crap. Okay, things get pretty detailed pretty quick. The CPU has those details. Okay, it's, it has a set of magic tricks that it knows how to do, which Intel, the creator of our, our modern CPUs, um, uh, the ones that are on most of your computers at least, has decided that here are the 500 mag magic tricks that when used in any sort of order can solve a general classification of problem. Okay? And then next year when they come out with their new processor, they'll decide, okay, well, those are all still good and here's 30 more that we think are helpful. Something like that. All right, so a low-level language is a language that a human being could program in. We tend to avoid it. Um, because it is tedious, but it does still look English-like. And then when we actually run it on the CPU, and it gets translated with every line of code we wrote into an instruction the CPU understands, problems get solved. Finally, high-level language has a one-to-many relationship with the CPU. That's our power tool. And humans like power tools, right? One line of code that we write translates into a whole bunch of instructions that the CPU performs. And so if we were writing that proverbial, your very first program is usually hello world. If we were writing the hello world program in a low level language like assembler, it might be 20 or 30 lines of code. That same program in a high level language is like one line of code that under the hood is doing those 20 or 30 things. Make sense? So, three types of programming languages. All right, any questions about anything we talked about today? All right, so between now and next class, uh, go ahead and get on, get on to Angel. Make sure that you have access to the class. Make sure you see the syllabus. Uh, make sure you see the textbook up there. Just make sure everything's working so we can get everybody, uh, if I have to add anybody to the class or change anything, we can. Um, otherwise, I will see you next class. Always the threat of a quiz. I'm not promising one. I may not give one, but there's always a threat. I'll see everybody on Wednesday.